Meanwhile, according to the Wall Street Journal, economists at UBS, Standard Charter and Nomoro say that the real estate sector is the biggest risk to China's economy, which has slowed significantly from the double-digit growth rates of a decade ago. And to further discuss this, we're joined by Anne Lee, adjunct professor of economics and finance at New York University and author of What the U.S. Can Learn from China. Anne, as always, great to have you on the show. Thanks for having so, me. So, we saw Lenora report, we saw Grace Brown's report that um, there's been some relaxing of the standards of the rules for China's housing market. Good idea or bad idea? I think it's a bad idea. And this is true of all economies. When they relax the rules too much and people uh, basically start uh, leaving credit to people who can't afford it, you create housing bubbles and then you create a crash. I mean, this is so basic and uh, so many economies just went through it, the U.S. included, that I'm surprised that China is willing well, to do this. Well, the official policy is still that there is a 30% down payment requirement. That is still official policy. Real estate developers are just seeing how they can push the boundaries and they have been able to get away with it with local and state officials not really intervening. Do you think they should then? Of course they should, but of course if those local officials are being bribed under the table to look the other way, then uh, it's tough to stop that, right? But So it's always enforcement of regulations that becomes the issue in China. So you don't think the regulations should be changed in order to give the economy a bit of a boost? I mean, we saw the economists at UBS, Standard Chartered and Morrow, saying that China's economy is declining, and considering so much of that is tied up to the housing sector, perhaps we need True, a push to get but, out of the slump. But the problem is, is that the uh, housing has become so unaffordable for many people in China. And this has been a housing run-up that has been largely wealthy families and folks putting their wealth in real estate and not in financial markets. And the Chinese need to diversify their abilities to invest their wealth in other areas other than real estate. And given that uh, this has already been a concern for a lot of government officials, what they should have done is basically said, we're going to keep these tight lending standards, um, but we are going to put in incentives to encourage more uh, low-income housing. Uh, maybe the government even needs to uh, jump in and, and kickstart this, but provide tax incentives or other tax breaks in but this at, area. But at the same time, we are seeing a cooling off across the country in the housing sector. So you so, think yeah, that should just so be left? So I think in? that the pent-up demand for the middle income and high income um, has been satiated, which is why you have a dropping off of the housing demand on that high end. However, there is still plenty of need for low-income housing because there's still people living in very squalid conditions in China, and that's what needs to happen. Put these people in a home, and then they can start buying electricity, buying appliances, doing all these things that can keep the economy going. That's what China needs to focus their housing, redirect their housing policy towards. Here's some of the confusion. There was tremendous concern about a housing bubble uh, in 2008 and in 2011, measures were implemented to restrict lending to make sure that the property market does cool down. Now, it seems to have cooled down. How do you strike the right balance between generating GDP growth and maintaining the housing sector at a comfortable level? Well, this is precisely what I'm talking about. You're talking about different sectors along this whole real estate spectrum. And all the focus has been on the high end and now you can maintain the high GDP growth so, by so redirecting it to the low. For the lower income. For the housing. lower income, because you have a large group of people have been shut out of the housing market. If you allow them to buy into the housing market, and then they can buy all the things that go with owning a home, like furniture, like all these things I was talking about, appliances. Right. You can then create more consumption and therefore keep the GDP growing. And that is the missing piece here, as well as the fact that they uh, don't encourage rentals of all these places. So there are people with multiple homes. They may not allow them 
in the same city in Shanghai and Beijing, but they probably own them in other places. Now, they should uh, be encouraged to rent these properties out to the low-income people, but there's a tax on the rental income but there's only a one-time tax on the real estate. So if they actually put a usage fee, such as property taxes on these right. things, that would also encourage more people to move into these empty buildings. And that could also create more GDP growth. In the meantime, we are seeing the higher end sector, not the lower end sector that you're talking about, experiencing some cooling off. What are the financial implications for that with regarding the financial industry? Well, certainly, uh, the cooling off could hurt some developers and some property owners. And if uh, it was let to, if there's no government intervention, uh, I would not be surprised if it came off even 20%. And that would seem extreme. But frankly, people who have invested in wealth management products and all these other mm -hmm. trust products, I mean, these are the super wealthy. And if they're going to put their money in these products, they should already have calculated those risks and know that there's no free lunch and there are no guarantees on these things. Right. Okay. So. As always, great to have you on the show. And Lee, adjunct professor of economics and finance at New York University and author of What the U.S. Can Learn from China.